welcome to our program Where God Weeps, a program in which we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Today we consider the situation of the church in Cameroon. Located on the west side of Central Africa, the Republic of Cameroon has one of the strongest economy performances in the continent. This economic growth has been possible thanks to a stable political scenario. A country extremely rich in natural resources that nevertheless has a third of its population living below international poverty threshold. To learn more about the work of the Church in Cameroon, it is my privilege to welcome to our program Reverend Andrew Funia Nkea from the Diocese of Mamfe. Your Excellency, welcome to our program. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, you have a very interesting family background. Uh, can you tell us about, about uh, the family where, where you grew up and how uh, a vocation grew up in, in this environment? I think uh, one of the things uh, those who read my biography on the internet would not understand is the kind of Christian environment in which I grew up. Uh, basically, in the African cultures, especially where polygamy reigns, uh, you have those who are practicing this either because they found themselves unable to help themselves in it, but who are very strongly convinced of the things that the church teaches. And sometimes you get people who grow up, like myself, grew up in a polygamous family, but in a very Christian context. Uh, going to the church, uh, serving the mass. And so the community support is very strong. And I think that's one of the things that uh, once you get a family like that, which is detached from the church, then it is difficult. God alone can work miracles. But I think for my case, I grew up in a polygamous family, but with the support both of the family and of the community, it was, it was a very Christian community, and uh, all that helped me. And uh, I think your, your mother was uh, Protestant, or is Protestant, and your father uh, was Catholic. Was Catholic. Why you were brought up as, uh, as Catholic? My mother, meantime, after my appointment as bishop, became Catholic. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, so she's <laughs> well, now that's Catholic. that's wonderful news. <laughs> well, I never used to discuss church with her. We related as so mother and son. And she wanted to keep her Presbyterian faith. And uh, I didn't see myself forcing my mother to do what, what she didn't want. That was what she wanted. But uh, it, 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 all this can be explained from the missionary evangelization in the place where I come from, in Fontem. The part of Fontem, where we call the Bangwa area, was evangelized by the Catholic missionaries. The Mundani area, where my mother comes from, was evangelized by the Presbyterians. So there was a line in between the Bangwa and the Mundani. If you see a Mundani now who is a Catholic, it's a converted one. And if you see a Bangwa who is a non-Catholic, it's a converted one. So it was, there was a, this line of Presbyterians and Catholics. And you know how it was in those days. You didn't cross the line very easily. So my father, meantime, was working in the Mundani area and met my mother and they got married. And my mother wanted to maintain her Presbyterian faith. But then my father brought us all up as Catholics, according to the teachings of uh, the church. So, and we have really never had it as an issue. All my brothers and sisters were all Catholics. So my mother had her faith, but after my appointment as bishop, I didn't discuss it with her. She the first time I met her after the appointment, we talked about many things, and she said to me at the end, so what must I do to be Catholic? <laughs> that must be quite a nice surprise for you. Yes, it was a very nice surprise for me. So on the day of my Episcopal ordination, 
I gave my mother communion for the first time. That is wonderful. Yeah. So for me, it was a very big grace, a moment of grace for my entire family. And uh, above all, it was uh, an Episcopal gift for me. So a whole, a whole new age for you <laughs> is, is uh, coming. Yes. Um, Your Excellency, Cameroon has the reputation of being like a microcosm or, or like a micro-Africa because of the diversity that, that it has, not only geographically, Uh, but also in terms of, of uh, so many tribes, so many languages and dialects. What does this represent to the church? Is this a challenge to, to be able to provide pastoral care to such a diverse community? Generally in Africa, we say Cameroon is Africa in miniature. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, in Africa you find a bit of everything. In Cameroon you find a bit of everything you find in Africa. For us, it is both a challenge and a wealth because you don't have a situation where one tribe can actually influence and pull the people to one side or you don't have a situation where you could have ethnic clashes on very grand scale. Uh, at the same time, all these various tribes and peoples have something positive to contribute to the church in terms of their culture, in terms of their values, And uh, I think the church is trying to reach out to the various peoples in their various cultures. In that way, it's a big challenge because from one tribe to the other, it's just we're talking about a distance of 30, 40 kilometers. They are talking a different language. They speak, they eat something different. They, they, their way of behavior is completely different. So in that way, in one diocese, you have to get a variety of reactions about a particular thing. This is a challenge. But at the same time, you, want, you get a church where people are different and they contribute their different ideas and talents and cultures onto the same plate. It's a very big wealth for our local church. I would think it's more of a wealth than of a disadvantage. That is, that's a wonderful way to see it, you know, mm -hmm. as, as a richness, mm -hmm. uh, all this um, diversity. Another very interesting thing about uh, Cameroon Your Excellency, is that uh, it has had quite a considerable economic growth, uh, particularly in the last decades. It's evident that this has been uh, happening because of the political stability that is unfortunately not that common in some other African countries. However, this political stability has a price. Um, you have a government that has been in power for over 30 years. Do you think it is worth this price to be able to achieve uh, the economic growth that you have nowadays? One of the things I believe in is that uh, people need to live in harmony. And there are many ways of living in harmony uh, without necessarily following a set pattern. And uh, from our traditional societies, you see a situation where we have a traditional chief who loves his people, who is ready to work for his people. Nobody bothers. He is a traditional chief, we believe in that. But if you look at a situation where uh, in Cameroon, for example, we have one president for 30 years. Sometimes people ask me questions about this when I travel. And I say, what would we have? Would we rather have one man stay there and our children are going to school happily or we'll want to be changing people every day and the country is in chaos with fighting? Uh, I am uh, getting to 50 now, uh, but we have never had war in our country since independence. And uh, this is not something which is common in Africa. We have never had a military coup. So when people are talking about Uh, starvation, we may starve in various parts of the country for other reasons, not because of war or instability. So what would we rather have? Changing presidents and fighting? Or have a relative stability and move on? So I will say that there's no condition which is permanent. When the time comes for the head of state to go, he's the second. The first went, the second will go. But what we want for our country is peace and stability. For me, that is priority peace and stability. And it is quite a contrast with um, the countries 
uh, around Cameroon. And that is my, my next question, Your Excellency. The situation of uh, refugees. Um, Cameroon is receiving refugees from Central Africa, that it's uh, in the northeast border of the country, but also from Nigeria, uh, from the, uh, in the northern part as well. Uh, people you know, that are, that are uh, escaping all this terror from Boko Haram, but also from the south with the Congo. So uh, this, is, this is a challenge definitely for, for the church to attend uh, refugees. Well, we say that Cameroon is an island of peace. And uh, this is because practically all the countries around us have had some kind of fighting, except ourselves. But then we always uh, feel the heat coming from this fighting around the other countries. Recently, the entire Episcopal Conference, we decided to contribute money and uh, put together to help the refugees in, uh, for coming in from Central Africa and from Nigeria. Uh, this is not because we have, but because we feel the need to be able to share with our brothers and sisters who are also in their own need. So these refugees came in from Central Africa uh, to Betwa and to Baturi and all those places. So we made a collection in all the churches and we put the money together uh, through the Episcopal Conference and sent to Central Africa to help the refugees. The same in the north, it is also happening. And uh, you have all these little skirmishes around us and we always feel the heat. Uh, we have been discussing this a lot in our National Episcopal Conference, especially the past year about what to do to help. We cannot, it belongs to the government to be able to prevent insurgents from coming in. But when, then when people who are innocent people run for their lives, we need to give them food, we need to give them shelter. And part of this is sensitizing the local communities where these people come in to, to welcome them, to see how to share, give them a roof under, on, on, you know, over their heads. And I think our local population is responding very well. But there is a challenge. And the challenge is that the government has a very heavy task of making sure that some of these insurgents do not disguise as refugees and come in to the country. Of so that is a very delicate aspect. And in which case, the workers of the, in the refugee camps are being sensitized to be vigilant, to see the kind of activities that go on in these refugee camps. Because Boko Haram, for example, in the north, they don't have a uniform. They don't have any sign on them. They run in like any other uh, refugees running in. And sometimes you can be feeding a man, thinking that you are helping a refugee who is suffering, who is just a Boko Haram member. So that is a very big challenge for us when we are doing this. But then we have to, say depend on government to do its own work of security. Meanwhile, we are just doing humanitarian services. We are not getting involved into who is a politician or who is not a politician or who is a militia or not. We are just doing humanitarian services. And the church works directly in the refugee camps? In the north, the Bishop of Marwa Mokolo, the former bishop, Bishop Stevens, uh, did a lot of work himself, you know, reaching out to these people. We just had a new Bishop of Marua Mokolo, who is only a couple of, uh, just two months ordained as Bishop to succeed uh, Bishop Stevens. So he is still new in the situation. But Bishop Stevens really had the situation at hand and he knew the people so he could use the people to work uh, in some of these camps. Your Excellency, and in general, the, the human resources and financial resources of the church are enough for the pastoral work of, of uh, the faithful of Cameroon? Human resource, uh, we are just uh, 50 years independent. Uh, independent. A very young nation. It's a very young nation. And uh, our church is only just celebrating in various dioceses, the centenary of the Cat Catholic Church, the coming of the faith. So with only 100 years against the 2000 years that Christianity and Catholicism has existed, mm -hmm. uh, it is not easy. We will say that we are a baby church. Indeed. We are a baby church. And uh, being a baby church, we have uh, a lot of challenges. The formation of personnel, uh, the setting up of structures, 
and we are dealing with a situation where the people are still struggling with uh, economic problems of their own families, of the nation, of the society. So there's always this struggle. And uh, the people are doing their best, but our best can never be good enough for the growth of the church. Uh, our churches are, uh, the, the population is rising very high of our Christian population. Uh, where do we keep them? I was ordained in the public square because we couldn't get a church where we would take well, the people. For so many people, that's yes. wonderful. <laughs> so, and you have so other communities, we have two, three masses, we are multiplying. So there is a consciousness uh, of, Christ of the Christian values, which is sweeping it. We don't want to miss the chance. But then if we are depending on what our own people can do, I'm afraid that we may miss the chance. They are doing their best bet. Their best is not competing with the rapid growth. Well, but that's a good, a good, a good problem to have, <laughs> Your Excellency, you know, a church that is growing. You mentioned uh, that it's a young, a very young church, but it is a very young nation. I, I was really surprised, Your Excellency, to see that the, um, the average age in, in Cameroon is 18 years old. I mean, it's extremely young population. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for, for, for you as, 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 a, as a bishop? I think it's one of the biggest challenges because uh, besides our church, we, we need people who can mentor the young. The young need adults, responsible adults to look up to. And yet the young have to be catered for in a way that they must be conscious that they are the leaders of tomorrow. And I think this is where we have to focus a lot on our youth programs because without those youth programs, the youth just look up to whatever they see. They look at the television, they look at uh, the fashion, and they just follow the, the times. But we have to put responsible programs in place, catechesis and moral programs that will help and mold the kind of youth we want for the adult population of tomorrow. This is the biggest challenge. Sometimes you drive along the road when the schools are closed and you see the endless young people and you say, where are all these going to? But as I say, that instead brings up the fact that we need to put these programs in place for the young people. Let the church be able to guide the young people. And I think for now, we are in a very good position because the young people trust the church. They look up to the church. Uh, I think this is where we are a bit different from Europe. That's, a, that's an excellent yes. <laughs> position to be in. Yes, they still trust the church, they still look up to the church. So we don't want them to look up to us and we have nothing to offer. And I think this is a challenge on the side of the church. We must be able to put things in place, put programs in place that will help answer the need that the youth want today to be responsible adults tomorrow. We mentioned that uh, you, the, the country has one of the highest literacy rates in Africa. What is involvement of the church in this regard? Because now that we're talking about formation of youngsters and all that, this must be one of the main fields. The Catholic Church since independence has been very involved in uh, education. And uh, actually the first secondary school in the whole of Cameroon is St. Joseph's College Sase which was opened by the Catholic missionaries, the Mihil missionaries. So, and the first girls' school, the first girls' college, was uh, Queen of the Rosary College of Koyong in my diocese, which was opened by the Catholic Church. So, the Catholic Church from the very beginning has been very involved in education, but we have very, very serious challenges. And the challenges are coming from the fact that government schools have come up and with free education. Mm -hmm. We can't run schools free, so our schools are getting empty. But yet it is not easy to transmit our values in the government schools. Because then you have to go through the inspector, you have to go through all kinds, to get one hour of uh, time to teach moral education, not even doctrine. Because we do moral instruction to the government schools, which is completely different from when we teach Catholic doctrine. And uh, we have that difficulty that our schools are getting smaller, especially the primary schools. We can't pay the teachers anymore. I have at least seven schools in my diocese 
which has a population, which have a population of less than 60, the whole school, and you need seven teachers in this school, how do you pay them? And the time, we don't have the, the possibility anymore where government gave us frequent uh, assistance, uh, financial aid and subsidies for the schools. So this is a very big challenge for the church. And uh, we have secondary schools, thank God our secondary schools, some are doing well. And we use that chance to provide this formation to the youth, which we think will help them to be responsible citizens of our country. To have this moral consciousness that community property is not individual property. And uh, we do our best in that regard, but it is not easy. But it's, they call the, the, the church is very involved. Now we have gotten into the realm of uh, tertiary education. Uh, we have a provincial university which we are running uh, for the church. I was registrar of that university. And my experience there for three years before I was appointed was a very positive one. I think it was high time the church started something like that. And uh, because you, could, you can see, uh, we started, it's, it's an agent of evangelization. People are conscious of certain values. Uh, they, they are conscious of human values. And uh, these are people who will impact society tomorrow. And uh, finally, Your Excellency, what would you like people to know about the church in, in Cameroon? What are your challenges uh, and, uh, yeah, what would you like people to know about the work that you, as bishop, with your, your brothers, are doing? I think uh, one thing I must say here is that, uh, thank God, we have a very, very vibrant church. The church is growing very fast in Cameroon, and uh, Cameroon started well, in 1950, 55. We had uh, the first diocese was opened in 1950, and that was the diocese of Buya. In 55, there were three, four more dioceses, five dioceses, but now we have grown to 25 dioceses, and the population keeps growing. The Christian population is there and the challenges are growing. The second thing is that we have a very, very, we, are, we thank God for this all the time, a great number of vocations, genuine vocations. Uh, we want to open a second seminary in my diocese for the province because we are working as a province, a ecclesiastical province. We had one seminary before. Now, because of the number of vocations, we want to open a second seminary in Mamfe. But all these, how can we cope with the numbers? There are many young men offering their lives to become priests. And we're not talking about young men who are running away from poverty. We're talking about quality vocations. Yeah, what do we do with them? How do we get the seminary going? So those are some of the challenges we have. Our people are struggling, they are doing their best, but sometimes we cannot go too far. And. Uh, for my diocese particularly, uh, there are only two things I keep insisting to the people. The two longs of the church in Mamfe, the pastoral and the economic long. We are struggling to implement the provincial pastoral plan. We have a pastoral plan, and that is in the formation of small Christian communities. There is just no way we can succeed in the pastoral and spiritual life in the diocese of Mamfe without these small Christian communities. Because we have all these uh, Pentecostal sects coming in from Nigeria and from neighboring places, and they are very aggressive against the Catholics. The only way we can survive is in these small Christian communities. So for me, that is something, it's, it's a priority for me in the pastoral life of the Diocese of Mamfe, the formation of par par basic Christian communities so that everybody feels the keeper of the other. And secondly, on the economic side, for us to start working, uh, trying to see how we can become a self-reliant church. I'm encouraging the priests, I'm encouraging the Christian faithful, let us carry out diocesan and parochial agricultural projects. At least we can take our cutlasses and go to the farm and plant the food we eat, we eat, yeah. you know? So in that case, 
we can start planting and then we can see how we can sell some and see how we can help ourselves as a local church. So while we go out to ask for assistance from others, we should first try to see how we can help ourselves. And uh, in starting these agricultural projects, it's not easy, <laughs> but uh, I have faith. I have faith. I believe that uh, if God is uh, seeing, uh, God has been with us, He will see us through. The ideas are coming. The inspiration is coming from Him, and uh, He is going to see us through. Of course, definitely, it will. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you so much for for sharing with us. Uh, this very interesting and, as you said, vibrant uh, reality of the church in, in Cameroon. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us again in another program of Where God Weeps. If you want to learn more about the Catholic Church in Cameroon and in other parts of the world, please contact the information at the end of this program. Thank you and God bless. I